We're not live, are we? We're live. We're live. Hey, everybody, you're very welcome. Hi. <laughs> we are live. Please keep the swearing to a minimum. We're live. <laughs> oh, right. So, <laughs> everybody who isn't a student, you're very welcome to this talk. Anybody who is a student, go and do your assignments, for God's sake, will you? No. So, I'm going to give a talk on hackers in the movies. The portrayal of hackers, how right is it, how wrong is it, how long has it been going on for? So I'm from DIT. Come on down, DIT. Okay, great. <laughs> so, we'll start with the trailer. <laughs> it speaks well that you appreciate that. <laughs> well, production value is on an all time. I don't know. Great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all done in PowerPoint. So, a very long time ago, this is a story I need to tell you. When I was very young, and you can see I was much tenor than, than I am now. <laughs> the very first job I got, in fact, I worked for a company whose name I will not name. But uh, there was me, and there was seven other programmers. My boss, and there was two other managers. And then his boss, and there was one other manager. Uh, my boss was like a wolf man. He was very hairy and shedding all the time. And his boss was like the invisible man. He never turned up. When I started working in the IT industry, it is a long time ago. It was during one of the IT booms. I don't remember which one, but it was very busy anyway. We, um, we were doing Y2K, we were doing Euro conversion, and we were doing putting stuff on the web all at the same time. It was a very busy time. Because the boom was so good, both my boss and my boss's boss quit the company I worked for after three months. And who do you think they ended up hiring as my boss's boss? Only me. So I ended up being my own boss's boss within three months of starting, answering directly to Big Brother, the owner of the company. My first job was to create the software security policies for 17 companies that were our clients, which was a bit of a bummer, because I didn't know anything about software security policies. It left me confused and bewildered, basically. I was stunned. But I did do research, because I was a good student. When I was in college, I knew research was important. So I looked up and found what a security policy is. And a security policy typically, most importantly, tries to identify the risks, the threats, the vulnerabilities and does a risk analysis. And in several books, what it says is use your combination of experience and imagination to create a risk analysis. Now, given that I was only working for three months, um, we, we, it would be fair to say I was short on the old experience of Rooney. So I ended up using my imagination. And all I really knew about computer security was stuff I had seen in movies. So the security policy I wrote included things like, you may be scanned by the MCP into the game zone and may have to fight with frisbees. Angelina Jolie may chase you. Um, you may start global thermonuclear war. Um, you might even meet Robert Redford. As it happens, this was in the 90s. Quite recently, I went to one of the organizations of the 17 companies and checked the security policy. And amazingly enough, much of what I had put in 20 years ago is still there because people just don't read computer security policies, I'm afraid. Maybe somebody in the IT department did and laughed for a little bit, but otherwise nobody reads these documents, which is a shame because they do govern what we do and what we don't do. But for most IT people, the way you know whether you're allowed to bring in a memory stick or not is somebody tells you. So this research seeks to identify whether movies, which I thought was real life, accurately portrays what's going on in the real world, and particularly for non-technical managers who are paying for computer systems, who are paying for firewalls. They have no idea what's going on in the moment they see in the movie, so is that right or wrong? We will point out the difference between the term hacker and the term hacker. So sometimes the term hacker, originally the term hacker is described by Stephen Levy, was somebody who hacks good code, writes good computer code, 
that's clever and really well done. Whereas people who break in systems were called crackers then, but the media picked up the term hacker and thought that meant a hacker is somebody who hacks into computer systems. So still, the, the culture I come from, when we say hacker, we mean somebody who's got fierce kung fu hacking skills. They're a good coder. Whereas I know for people out there, they think hacker means cracker. So what did I do for this research? What I did was I compiled a list of 200 movies that had computer themes in them from books and from websites and tried to see which ones actually represent hacker movies and which aren't really hacker movies. So I used a technique called grounded theory. I wouldn't worry about it. If, if anybody here or in there knows what eeny, meeny, miny, mo is, can't do that but with science. And I ended up with six rules. These are the six commandments that define whether a movie is a hacker movie or not. So rule number one is a hacker movie must feature a hacker. So it's not sufficient if there's just a hack in it. We have to see a hacker as well because I want to see if non-technical managers or non-computer people, if they identify with a hacker character and think, oh, that's what hackers are like. Number two, not all cyberpunk movies are hacking movies. So Blade Runner, for example, is a cyberpunk but there's no real hacking in it. I mean, he does kind of hack the photograph in it a little bit, but there's no real, real hacking. Only science fiction movies were recognizable hacking, so kind of almost all science fiction movies, some of them have weird biological hacking, like um, the David Cronenberg movie, Existence, that has kind of weird, freaky biological hacking. Even Ghost in the Shell, I suppose, has mind hacking more than computer hacking, so we'll skip those. No animated movies, just because that gets very complicated otherwise. Cryptography is not the same as hacking. So for example, uh, U5271 or Enigma or any of those movies about hacking the codes in World War II, they're kind of like hacking, but not like hacking as we, we know it. And we're, only, we're not going to worry about steal this movie or anything like that, so we're not going to focus on documentaries for the moment, because documentaries just have such a little viewership compared to movies. So I ended up with, out of the list of 200, got down to 50 hacker movies, and these, they, they start either in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, or the 2000s. If you're on Twitter and follow me, tweet your guests now. Have a shout out. Do you think the first hacker movie was in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s? To the 60s. The 80s, I like it. The 90s. The 2000s. As you can see, we have a highly interactive audience here. <laughs> Give me a shout out for the 50s. The 60s. Yeah. Ah, yes. They looked ahead in the slides, that's all that happened. I saw them Googling. Hey. Perfect. It's not illegal. So, this is the 50 movies. They span a while. We'll look at a few of them in detail. In the 1950s, there was a movie. In 1957, called Desk Set, starring Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. If you don't know Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn more, they were kind of like the Justin Bieber and Lady Gaga of their day. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 57, it was uh, filmed in, 58 released in. Uh, it concerned this research library that, was, that Catherine Hepburn ran that was going to be replaced by a computer system that Spencer Tracy was. They didn't call them a computer scientist, they called them an operations manager. So her library staff were going to be replaced by a computer. So she doesn't quite hack the system, but she does pour water into the computer and it goes up on fire. Which I don't really think is hacking in the true sense of it. It's, it's not a nice thing to do, but it's not really hacking. But really, we need to go to 1960. And in 1968, we have a movie with Peter Ustinov, Maggie Smith, who I'm sure everybody knows from Harry Potter movies. Carl Malden, who was in the streets of San Francisco, and even, God knows, Bob Newhart there. So we might see if we can look at a little bit of the trailer for Hot Millions, which we're, we're saying is... Ah, holy desktop, for, <laughs> I tried it especially for you guys. Great, Hot Millions, here we go. We might need to make this a little bit bigger. One more time. Double size. 
is Caesar. Caesar Smith. He's imaginative, analytical, logical. He's a hacker. Capable of concentration and meticulous care. Caesar Smith is a computer man. A computer man. He's also the most successful this is what in the modern business world. Does that happen when you guys talk? No? No, oh, man. So to use the analogy of music to try and explain what computers were. Thanks, Smith. Professor McGonagall to you and me. As long as that blue light is on, the computer is singing. Okay, what? Well, Embezzlers. So what he does is screws out the blue light, embezzles money, then screws it back in. So we're talking high-tech hacking here. Caesar Smith is a thief. Caesar Smith? Looks like zany stuff. For me, this is like hardware porn. But anyway, so in the movie, his name is really Caesar Smith. He pretends to be a computer scientist, an expert, who is doing pop quizzes on the staff in the company, asking them, "Do you know how to create a fake company? Do you know how to create a fake check?" He's pretending he's checking them if they know how to set up fake companies, and then he's doing it in the evenings and embezzling all the money. Um, so that's definitely hacking as we know it. Indeed, movies like Office Space or Superman 3, you can see directly come from that idea of industrial embezzlement. The following year, there was a movie called The Italian Job with Michael Caine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with The Italian Job. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Benny Hill, the British comedian famous for chasing scantily clad women in slow motion to humorous music, or being chased by scantily clad women, plays Professor Simon Peach in this movie, who hacks into the Italian traffic light system and is able to change the lights so that the Mini Coopers can do all kinds of funny stuff. Uh, it is interesting to think the first probably reported embezzlement is 1971, and there's already two movies about embezzlement or hacking in, in the movies, so it was happening, but companies weren't reporting it. We move on to the 70s. Something very interesting happened in 1971 in America. The censor decided to relax um, the restraints on nudity and violence in movies. So if you look at any 70s movie with Gene Hackman, there's usually nudity and violence in it. And because the censors didn't ban those movies, um, they became very popular. As a consequence of that, we don't really see much hacking, people sitting at computers because we have far more exciting things to be looking at, apparently. We do get, in 1974, a Gene Hackman movie, incidentally, called The Conversation, where he's an audio-visual surveillance expert who inadvertently uh, hears a conversation between two very senior American politicians, and um, he kind of gets in trouble over it. It's not, there's no computer hacking in it, but it has the same kind of sweaty, paranoid, weird freakiness as you'd expect in a hacker movie. And indeed, a picture from this movie appeared in the 2003 Will Smith movie, Enemy of the State, where Gene Hackman played Brill, this hacker expert. So it does have hacker roots. The only other movie reader from the 70s I can think of that has a bit of hacking in it is um, R2-D2 hacking into the Dead Star. R2-D2 managed to locate Princess Leia, in, uh, who also managed to stop the trash compact compactor Squeeze and chewy hand Luke and Leia. So it's not exactly great hacking, but it's a bit of hacking anyway. So Star Wars, yeah. I hear it's popular. In the 1980s was the heyday of hacking movies in a way. We had 10 movies that had significant hacking in it. In Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Lieutenant Savak and Captain Kirk used the access code of the USS Reliant they hack into the Reliance computer because they know the Starfleet firewall code and they take down the Reliance shields in the middle of a space battle. So that's not bad hacking. Uh, in 
1982, Jeff Bridges, Bruce Boxleitner, and Cindy Morgan started a movie called Tron. David Warner and Bernard Hughes as well, obviously. Um, about a hacker called Kevin Flynn who gets sucked into the game grid and has to play games. Kevin Flynn, Jeff Bridges' character, actually says, I've been doing a little bit of hacking. So that's the first time the term hacking is said on screen. And then in Superman 3, Richard Pryor plays a guy who's good at yo-yos. He's good at doing loops and good with strings. So he does a computer training course and it turns out he's good with computers as well. He does what's called a salami slicing attack. So all this, he works for a company that does hundreds of thousands of employees. And rather than embezzle from, from, from the company big time, he just takes half a cent out of everybody's pay packet. So then he takes a tiny little slice and, and sometimes one cent off. So nobody's noticing they're losing much money, but he's getting $50,000 or $100,000 every month. So that's called salami slicing attack. It's a nice thin slice, so you don't notice it's happening. In the movie, Robert Vaughn is the owner of the company, and he goes, oh, this hacker is brilliant. He's, we're never going to find him because he's going to keep that money, keep a low profile, and then we'll never know who did it. And then he opens his window, Richard Pryor is driving a big new car playing loud music with all new clothes. <laughs> kind of a dumb hacker. Anyway, he does bad things to Superman in the movie as well. And then War Games. For many people, this was a seminal hacker movie. Um, features Matthew Broderick breaking into, accidentally, the Pentagon's top secret thermonuclear program and uh, almost blowing up the world. We'll look at a quick clip just for a second because I want to make a point about something that people ask a lot. Sometimes people ask me, why do you think non-computer people are so afraid to use computers? Why do you think they think if I push the wrong button, the computer will explode? Why do, why do non-technical people think that? Do you think? So if we ever want to point to the reasons for techno stress or technophobia, I think we're looking at them right here and now. This is why, because you've got movies like this, where you push the wrong button or hack into the wrong side and suddenly the whole world is blown up. That can be a tad concerning, I think, if you're a novice computer user. So for technical people like us, we know it'll take at least three mouse clicks to do this. But if for non-technical people, they're afraid pushing escape or delete will cause the deletion of the whole world. So that's fair enough. War games, we'll talk about it a little bit later in detail as well for another reason. ATM hacking in a movie called Prime Risk with Dean Stockwell as the bad guy. Um, real genius star Val Kilmer as an MIT student. But some real, based on some real events that occurred in MIT, a guy lived underground for um, in the tunnels under MIT for a while, collected uh, uh, free student vouchers, and then bought 10,000 meals at McDonald's and things like that. So that's a lot based on a real story. Weird Science is a dreadful, dreadful movie that nobody should look at, and I apologize even for showing it, but they do hack into the electrical mainframe to get the power to power up. Blondie over there. A jumping Jack Flash with Whoopi Goldberg. She works for a, a company, and um, this character talks to her over her terminal screen, who's a spy, and then um, the spy is hacking into various places. Fun movie. First Bueller's Day Off, he does hack into the school number of absence record and reduces the number of absences. Bueller, Bueller, that man's my hero. <laughs> Terminal entry, uh, this group are trying to hack into a, a, an evil bank and they can't get the password and one of them is eating a chocolate bar and drops it on the keyboard and accidentally pushes the password buttons and the correct order on the keyboard. <laughs> it never happened to me. It never happened. So it's you, my A British movie, 1987, called Bellman and True, um, starring Bernard Hill, who played King Ted in, in Lord of the Rings. The guy was really old, who Wormtongue was hanging around, who Gandalf sucks the evil out of. He, he was also, for the older people, you know, 
or he's from the black stuff. He was Yasser Hughes and the most from the black stuff. So in this movie, he his son gets tiger kidnapped. They kidnap his son, he works for a bank, and they say, unless you st steal money from the bank using floppy disks, we'll keep your son or something like that. It was actually a mini-series in the UK, but released as a movie in America in 87. And then Die Hard. So we know that Theo hacks into the Nashikawa building? What's the building called? Nakatomi. Nakatomi. Nakatomi building, exactly. So Theo is the hacker in that. Ho, ho, ho. That's still brilliant, that line. 1989, that's the 80s done. Into the 1990s. By the 1990s, we've lots of hacking movies, and there's lots of diverse themes emerging. We have Robert Redford, Ben Kingsley, David Strathairn, Sidney Poitier, is it? Yep. Dan Aykroyd and River Phoenix playing a, what we call a, a white hat hackers or grey hat hackers, people who are hired by organisations to break into the company to see how good their systems are. So this is the job I think I'd love to be doing. I'd love to have, have that as a living, breaking into computer systems. Uh, the, the kind of MacGuffin or the plot device it's this magical box that can decrypt any computer system in the world. We haven't got one of those in real life, but it's nice in movies when they have those magic boxes that can open any password. Lawnmower Man, when um, James Bond was slumming it, based not on really on a Stephen King short story, because there's no virtual reality in the Stephen King short story, but nonetheless, um, that's what they claim. It's a Stephen King short story, but a good movie if you're very, very sleepy. <laughs> Jurassic Park, Wayne Knight, um, hacks the, well, he's doing insider hacking, so he is the security person for the Jurassic Park systems, and he creates a virus that shuts down all the systems, so a lot of hacking, it appears, we'll see some stats. It was interesting to look at the balance between outsiders breaking into the system versus insiders taking the system down from within. Alan Cumming, yeah. uh, uh, in Goldeneye, 1995. He's got a pen, if he clicks it twice, it will blow up. If, if, but, it, so, but he keeps clicking it, turning it on and off. It's a very exciting movie. The hacking is dubious. Johnny Mnemonic. It's brain hacking a little bit in Johnny Mnemonic and dolphins hacking. Dolphin hacking is dangerous, I wouldn't do it myself too much. Sandra Bullock. Her identity is changed, and she's framed for a murder because she's given a floppy disk on the beach that can hack into any system. This, I think, is another concern people started developing about, oh my god, these hackers could change my identity, they could frame me for a murder, they could, do, they could steal all my money from my bank. So movies like this do contribute to a paranoia about hackers. Hackers, 95 as well, um, hey, Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, <laughs> Matthew Lillard, Angelina Jolie and Sherlock Holmes there, they, um, the American one. They're in this, this movie, Hackers, Hack the Gibson. This movie actually influenced hackers in real life, particularly in America. They ended up copying the fashions, the styles, the phrases of the movie Hacker. So this had a fundamental effect on the look of hackers in, in the United States primarily. Is this one of the movies you guys have seen here? Yeah. So then, and did people come in on skateboards? <laughs> did anybody have a bet that they'd wear a dress? Anything like that? They no. were just disappointed there was no pool in the roof. <laughs> okay, I'll see if I have hackers here somewhere. Uh, I don't have hackers here somewhere. I'll see if I have it here somewhere. Too many hackers here somewhere, all right. Bad term, sorry. Mission Impossible. Tom Cruise lowers himself down and, um, wait, no, Tom Cruise lowers himself <laughs> down and um, hacks into, gets a, a, a list of all undercover agents, a knock list. Hacking, physical hacking as well as computer hacking. Another Dean Stockwell movie, uh, Twilight Man, where Again, somebody's identity is stolen. This is very much based on the Met. In the movie Independence Day, something miraculous happened. 
Jeff Goldblum managed to hack a computer's operating system using his Power Mac. I don't know about you guys, but I can't even make a Mac talk to another Mac, <laughs> a Mac talk to space alien technology. But they did it because Jeff Goldblum is really smart. He wants to fly. He's got powers. Let's see. What have we got? So he gave it a cold. That's because that movie is a little bit based on War of the Worlds, I suppose, the analogy of the virus made sense. Insider hacking in speed to cruise control. So Willem Dafoe is the head of IT security for this cruise company, and he hacks into the cruise ship to blackmail the owners to give them piles of money. It's the dream for all of us. <laughs> Patrick Stewart was in a movie called Masterminds with a mustache that looks ridiculous. <laughs> Here we go, Will Smith had to be at the stage. So uh, like the net, Will Smith is on the run. He talks to Gene Hackman from 1974 and goes, dude, rescue me. So uh, in a good state, it's definitely, I think, a great hacker movie. Gene Hackman has a Faraday cage in his room, which doesn't allow any electrical currents to go through, so he's completely secure in his Faraday cage. Existence, yeah, kind of hacking, but not really. The 13th floor, yes, hacking. So Office Space actually references Superman 3. They say in Office Space, we'll do a salami slicing attack, so we just take a penny off each, uh, each person, and that is a very, very good movie. Uh, uh, Scott Bakula, after Quantum Leap, but before Starfleet Enterprise, starred in a TV movie called Tom Clancy's Net Force. So in the movie Net Force, he's the head of, it's, in the it's set in the future, it's 2002, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Great Scott, we're back! And um, he, th this, Billionaire, the richest man in the world who owns a computer company who's released an operating system that almost everybody uses is about to release a browser that is so full of bugs and will hack into people, will allow the company, the unnamed company, to uh, spy on people that uh, Samuel Beckett has to leap into the quantum leap accelerator and vanish. I'm not sure who this character, his name is Will something, I don't know who he's supposed to be based on. <laughs> Could be anybody, who knows. Um, there was a movie about, um, called 23, it's a German movie, not the Jim Carrey movie, the number 23, about a real hacker called um, Hagbrandt in Germany who hacked into the CIA, the KGB, hacked into a bunch of real systems um, got a bit paranoid, started reading the Illuminati trilogy by Robert Anton Stevens, is it? And um, thought the Illuminati were chasing him and went a bit crazy. So the Illuminati may or may not have been chasing him, but nonetheless, he disappeared. People think he died and was stuck into a river. I doubt it. I'd say he's in some CIA hacking plant somewhere with his identity changed, chances are, in real life because that's what happens in real life. 
The Matrix. <laughs> the Matrix um, does have a little bit of hacking in the first 20 minutes, where he's still Thomas Anderson. He is a hacker at a time called Neo as well. So before it goes all crazy. Let's see, have we got anything about the Matrix on video? So as a lecturer in computer science, this is what my day is normally like. <laughs> yesterday for me. <laughs> it's tough stuff. All right. And in the end of the 90s, Noah Riley, that nice doctor from ER, who was later a librarian and fighting aliens in dark skies, and Anthony Michael Hall, who was in the dead zone, played Steve Jobs and Bill Gates in a TV movie um, called Pirates of Silicon Valley. It's I think one of the best portrayal of Steve Jobs so far, I like Michael Fassbender's version, I liked the guy from Two and a Half Men, his version, but I still think Noah Wiley's version is very, 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 very good. Into the 2000s now. By the 2000s, hacking has just become another theme. It's, it's not as big as it used to be, it's just for fun. So we have A movie about a real hacker called an America Takedown or Operation Takedown, in Europe Trackdown or Operation Trackdown, and um, sometimes called Hackers too. It's a, it's a movie about a real hacker called Kevin Mitnick. He's written a couple of books, The Art of Deception and The Art of Intrusion. Have people heard of either of those two books? Yeah. Brilliant. So, a lot of other hackers that I know say, he makes up a lot of stories and he didn't do a lot of the hacks he's saying that other people did instead. So there's claims that, but in this movie, this guy, Screet Ulrich, plays Kevin McNeck. It's a good movie, definitely, though. It's fun. It's like hackers. Jamie Foxx was in a movie called Late. We'll move on. <laughs> Wolverine and um, Staying Alive. <laughs> and Catwoman over there were in a movie called Swordfish. The name comes from a Marx Brothers sketch. So it's a Marx Brothers sketch where um, the password is Swordfish to get into a, a speakeasy. I, I'd advise you to look it up, it's a very funny sketch. Anyway, um, Hugh Jackman is able to do amazing hacking while being distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Felipe is in a movie called Antitrust where the evil billionaire owner of an IT company um, is going to release a browser that will allow you to spy on everybody else uh, and call Bill somebody again, this time played by Tim Robbins. So there's a bit of a theme as to evil corporations run by respectful gentlemen that we won't dwell on. Uh, Jeremy Northam and Lucy Liu in a movie called Cypher, which is an insider hacking this company hires Jeremy Northam um, to get a job in another company and break into their computer systems. It's a very fun movie. Adrian Paul from the Highlander TV series and two of the Highlander movies, Highlander 4 and 5, was in a movie called Cold Hunter that was also called Virtual Storm, that was also called Stormwatch. These movies that have a lot of different names it means they were kind of crap, so they tried to re-release them under a different name in Europe. Um, it's a take on the Matrix, as you can guess by the cover. Hercule Poirot is an evil hacker in a movie called Foolproof. <laughs> Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Willow's boyfriend from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Oz, who turns into a werewolf on weekends, um, plays the real Napster in the remake of The Italian Job. So he claims that he really invented Napster. 
uh, and he's a hacker in that movie. The core, we have, um, uh, yes, movies with me on. Hey, Serenity. Okay, Hi. don't stop the signal. So Mr. Universe, who is also the chap of numbers, right? He hacks into the federations, or the alliances, mainframes, and spreads the fact that the alliance experimented on this planet and did bad things. I won't tell you what happened in case spoilers, but if you've not, not seen Serenity or Firefly the TV series, go, go now and look at it. Uh, Harrison Ford and that lovely Paul Bethany, who was the evil monk in uh, The Da Vinci Code. But almost, I, I see this as almost an exact remake of Bellman and Troop from 87. Uh, Harrison Ford's family are threatened. He's the, secur the security of a large company. They'll steal all the money. The family will be in trouble unless Harrison Ford does what they say. The Nest 2.0, a sequel to The Nest, which was not a sequel to The Nest, but an exact remake of The Nest. So it was the exact same story, just a different actress playing Sandra Bullock in it. It was the exact same story, though, no change. Um, Chris Cooper, uh, Ryan Felipe, and Laura Linney in a, a true love story about a, a, a government operative, a, a CIA operative, who is really a Russian undercover agent who was selling, uh, who was sending information to the Russians. That's a very interesting movie, scary stuff. Oh. <laughs> okay, Die Hard 4.0 or Live Free or Die Hard, depending, again, what I said about the name changing when it goes from country to country. Draw your own conclusions about how good this movie is, but um, there is hacking in it, is all we can say. War Games, The Dead Code, like The Nest 2.0, is not a sequel, but rather an exact remake of the movie. It was a Canadian production. I think it went straight to video, possibly. So War Games, The Dead Code, involved, instead of hacking into a computer system using a modem, this guy goes onto a website and starts playing a game, and then accidentally, accidentally almost starts global thermonuclear war, which is very serious, and we shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> In real life, what, do you, what age do you think hackers are, on average? Do you think they're between 5 and 15? No. no. 15 and 25? No. Yeah. 25 and 35? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do we know? Well, it's hard to know, really, but there are a lot of grey hat conferences, like black hat conferences, where certainly ex-hackers come out and explain what they do, and for money, they will tell you what they did and how they did it and things like that. So there are a lot of people who were hackers and at the moment the average age is about 28 or 29. But they're the ones who are telling us about it so we don't know about the others. In the movies, the average age is 25 to around 35. So yeah, the movies are getting it right in terms of their portrayal of the age of hackers. How about jobs? In the movies, most of them work in the computer industry or are full-time hackers. They have various other jobs, like being an astromech droid. But there are a reasonable number who are the dreaded thing that we all hate, students. <laughs> in real life, in the movies, about 80% of hackers are outside attacks. So it's somebody who doesn't work for the company, who breaks into the building, who breaks into the computer system and steals stuff from the company, whereas only 20% are insider attacks. That is to say, they work for the company. If you work for the company, it's much easier to hack in. The company will tell you the password. So then, <laughs> it's not actually really great to be hacking at all. It's just, well, I know what the password is. All I have to do is get the money quickly, and nobody will, will notice. In real life, we have no idea how much the difference between insider hackers and outsider hackers. The reason this is a problem is because when banks get hacked, particularly by insiders, they don't tell anyone. And if, if a hacker says, I have all the passwords, uh, I will steal money, or I'll reveal your passwords on the internet, the banks just give them six or seven million, no problem to keep them quiet. Because it's worth giving people six or seven million as opposed to it being revealed in public that your bank security system is bad. Because if your bank security system is bad, people lose faith in your bank, they withdraw all the money from the bank, the bank crashes, 
you've got a recession. So banks will pay piles of money. This is advice for anybody out there and anybody here. If you're going to be doing hacking, get a job in a bank, steal all the passwords, then just say, look, I'm going to sell, put these passwords on the internet unless you give me six or seven million. And the bank will probably do it. And that's saying it's a great career because the banks probably have hitmen as well. But still, it's worth thinking about. A lot of research and a lot of books on computer security still keep saying, though, that hackers are teenagers in their bedroom or often high school, school students or university students. So it's amazing that academic research is so wrong about this fact. They keep restating this error that hackers are younger people. I think it's because of war games, personally. I think war games had a profound impact on people's views on hacking for a couple of different reasons. One is because in the 80s, anyway, people were very afraid of being destroyed by Russia. Ronald Reagan was on TV a lot saying, the Russians are the evil empire, they're going to do bad stuff to us. There were young hackers in America contacted by the KGB in the early 80s that was reported on the newspapers. And one other thing. This guy, Joseph Campbell, wrote a book called The Hero of a Thousand Faces. He wrote a book called The Monomyth. If people are a fan of um, the movie, The Star Wars, they'll know that George Lucas based Star Wars a little bit in this idea of the monomyth, Joseph Campbell's work. What Campbell says is that the story of a hero in a lot of stories is the same story over and over again. And if you, if you know the story, then you can fit myths from all over the world into this precise kind of story. So let's think of three examples where the story is the same story. We'll pick King Arthur, or Excalibur, we'll pick Lord of the Rings, and then we'll pick Star Wars. So in these three movies, you have a young man of humble origins. So King Arthur starts off as being the adopted son of Sir Leo. Um, Frodo is just a, a dude hanging around the Shire, and Luke Skywalker is brought up by his uncle Owen and Aunt Beru on tattooing, working as a spice moisture farmer. Each of them are given a magical weapon, Excalibur, Sting, and Darth Vader's lightsaber as it happens. Each of them are counseled by a wise wizard, Merlin, Gandalf, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Each of them must fight a dreadful monster, Mordred, Sauron, and Darth Vader. So it's the same kind of story. It follows this myth. What I think is that war games kind of follow the same thing again. So war games is about a young man of humble origins. His magical amulet, it says in Campbell's book, isn't a sword, but it's whopper. It's a magical computer that can blow up the world. His Merlin character is in the movie, he, late, late in the movie, he meets Professor Stephen Falcon, played by British actor John Wood, who advises him on how to overcome Joshua's problem of trying to blow up the world. And Dudley Coleman, the boss, evil boss from 95, is the evil bad guy in this movie. So I think because War Games follows this monomyth, it resonates in people in a profound way because these monomyths stick with people's minds. In the UK in the 1930s, this guy C.P. Snow, who's an academic, said, the problem with the world is there are artists and scientists. And then another critic, F.R. Leavis, said, no, artists and scientists do the same kind of stuff. And then Aldous Huxley wrote a book saying, artists and scientists kind of do the same stuff, but kind of do different stuff. This tells us a lot about academia. Somebody writes a book saying one thing, then somebody can write a book saying the exact opposite. Somebody can write a third book going, it's kind of one thing and kind of another. I only bring this up about the art and science because the, the way science is represented in the movies, we have to remember people who write movie scripts are not scientists or computer scientists, they're artists. So when they talk about computers, when they explore what but they use plot devices, they don't really know. I mean, they get technical consultants in, but the technical consultants they get in obviously don't know the fuck computers either, based on what, what, what are being represented in the movies. So, are, 
when artistic people are representing science in general, but computers in particular, they're not trying to represent the truth, they're trying to represent uh, a fairy tale or an artistic version of the truth. A verisimilitude, a simulation of the truth is what they're going for. So we shouldn't be getting our information about computers from the movies, that's all I'm saying. Here's a list of all the hackers from all the movies. All right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. Thank you very much. Questions are nudity now. <laughs> That's, yes, sir. Can you share your list of 50 hackers? Absolutely, indeed. So if you're on the web there, if you go to. <laughs> me. If you go to DamienTGordon.com, which is my website, you'll see hacker movies down there. I've got an Excel spreadsheet full of them. I'm doing this for TV shows as well, and I've got a list of 247 TV shows that have hackers in it already, and I'm only up to the year 2000 yet. So it's going to be a big problem getting them all done. Starting from where? Uh, maybe, well, in, there was an episode of The Avengers with John Steed and Emma Peel called The House That Jack Built, where this evil computer guy built a computerized house that was designed to kill Emma Peel. There was also an episode of The Man for, From Uncle, where Thrush were hacking into Uncle's computer systems in 1969. So it goes back a way. And there's an American um, cop show called Dragnet. And in 1969 as well, they had people doing embezzlement for all of like um, Hot Millions, would be used not the first movie. So it, it's the so you can't predate it. Very much so indeed. The Avengers 1968 is one of the four. But like if you look at a lot of modern TV shows, you've got the female hacker, you've got um, uh, in NCIS. There's NCIS, there's Arrow, there's Criminal Minds. Yeah. Uh, 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 of prey. Yeah. Oh, cool. of prey. I, I was, was going to ask um, most of the protagonists there seem to be male. Is, is there a growing trend of, of the female hacker, or is it still very much a stereotype that isn't being uh, used all that often? It's interesting. I think in TV shows, yes. because they're simple, you have the man doing the action and the woman sitting behind the desk. So it's okay for the woman to be the hacker, because it's almost like a secretary role still, I think the way they're doing it. She's fairly um, immobile in a sense. Yeah. If you think about particularly um, uh, Garcia in um, mm -hmm. Criminal Minds, with the blonde hair and funny glasses, she's always behind the desk, almost, yeah. a lot of the time, or even, um, yeah, so uh, definitely way, way more women in TV shows, but in movies it's still, a lot more male. Although we're getting better, we're getting better, but not, not, not great yet. Yeah. I personally would like to see a lot more women, not only in movies, but in computer science courses in general. You and everyone else. Because, <laughs> <laughs> particularly for teamwork, men suck at teamwork. They're very, very bad at teamwork. If there's just one female member of the team, just the teams go better. Yeah. Simple as that. So if you go into dailytgarden.com, you'll see this missing scenes from this and all kinds of other fun stuff if you want to have a go but barring that that's a cut we're, we're over no. bye bye see you next year <laughs> it's been real okay. thank you well we actually have questions oh no, no we, have, we have one question brilliant thank you uh, i almost got away if it wasn't really with the kids <laughs> Uh, have you seen Mr. Robot and do you think there'll be more shows like it? Oh, definitely. I think Mr. Robot is absolutely brilliant indeed. I, I definitely think how Hollywood works is if it's popular, they'll make 7 million of it. If it's not popular, they won't. So I definitely think Mr. Robot seems to be really, really popular. So I think they will. There was another show, what's it called? Silicon Valley or something? Yeah, Silicon yeah, Valley. That was, that I think preceded it. And I think there's, I think with the Big Bang Theory, for the yeah. first few years, that was very positive about nerdy hacker guys. And then once they realized they were popular, they were very harsh on 
nerdy guys all of a sudden. So I, I think that, that became a bit cruel, whereas I think the shows now, and, and really, I think people are more educated about what hackers are like in real life. And I'm not messing about what I said about war games. People were really scared about computers that push the wrong button and it would blow up. Whereas now, with Apple products, it, they're such consumer devices now. They're so normal to have an iPad and be able to do stuff with it. The people are, the fear is gone an awful lot. Can I ask who that question was from? Uh, Lorcan, our chair. Lorcan, you are the man. Thank you very much. Undoubtedly, this <laughs> You're the greatest man ever in the world. All of these people are millions to you, Lorcan. <laughs> well, uh, once again, thank you very much, yes. Damien. Thank you.